find new guest speakers and new students to help, help you guys uh, in your career at MAPC. So tonight we have uh, George Longroom run. Uh, he's a, uh, been a job, helping job seekers and recruiting for 30 plus years. Uh, I want to give him a special shout out and thanks. Our original keynote is a good friend of George's and he was in a serious car accident a week and a half ago. So he was able to find us, George, as a very suitable uh, replacement uh, for Mark. And so I want to thank him for doing this on such short notice, uh, basically a week or so. So I'm going to hand it over to George, and hopefully he will have some insight uh, and help you out in your career uh, here at MATC and in IT. Thanks. Thank you, and uh, thanks for having me here. Hopefully, you all get some good uh, information, some new ideas. Who all's on LinkedIn, by the way? Okay. Good. So I'm going to kind of skip the most remedial type information. I don't want to bore anybody, uh, but hopefully still make it relevant and you know uh, meaningful to people who are kind of newer with LinkedIn. So um, you might be wondering, you know, the impression this a keynote speaker dressed like this. What, what exactly is up with that? It must make an impression of some sort. Do I not really kind of respect what I'm doing here this evening? Do I not care? Do I not know that this is really not typically the way a keynote speaker dresses for a program like this? I mean, again, do I not know? Do I not care? Which of those, what, what are the messages those send? Or maybe, maybe I'm trying to send a message. I'm kind of a rebel. Maybe I, I, I'm trying to send the message that I'm so confident here that I don't really have to dress to impress. Maybe it's a gambit of some sort. Maybe I'm trying to relate to my audience. Okay, so the point I'm trying to make here is we need to understand who our audience is. We need to understand how do we be findable by those people? What are they looking for? And I'm obviously talking, you know, future, your careers, uh, recruiters. What are recruiters looking for? You know, one of the ideas here, LinkedIn, I think we all have gotten kind of the memo. We've gotten the memo that LinkedIn is supposed to put our best foot forward. So what exactly does that look like? What exactly does that mean? What are recruiters looking for and how are they trying to find it? And that's really kind of what I want to focus on uh, this evening. But really, in a sense, everything that I'm talking about is a little more kind of allegorical for just in general, our presence on social media and personal branding. Is that a, a term that you all have heard as part of your, your uh, education here? Or at least you're kind of familiar with it? I mean, it basically it just acknowledges the simple idea that we are all engaged in an exercise in sales and marketing, which, let's face it, is not necessarily something that a lot of IT people want to have anything to do with. If Coca-Cola was selling a brand, or I'm sorry, a product, what would that product be? What would the Coke ad sell? Bubbly sugar water. But there's an awful lot more to Coca-Cola advertising than that, isn't there? I mean, if you think back, especially if you're at all a student of advertising, if you think back, and I'm dating myself here, but my uh, grandmother used to have a stack of National Geographic's going back to like the 1930s and 40s. So years and years and years of Coca-Cola advertising, there were just all kinds of different ads, but they always evoked an awful lot more than bubbly sugar water. And I want to kind of use that as sort of a backbone for some of the characteristics then that I think are true of a good personal brand. Um, I think the first one, and perhaps the most important, especially in the world that we're living in, thanks to the internet, is authenticity. And this is true, by the way, no matter what type of branding we're talking about here, whether you're a multi-million dollar, billion dollar global you know, uh, corporation, or an individual, uh, or an employer, a smaller employer trying to sell their employer brand, I think this, these, all the characteristics I'm about to share, I think still remain uh, pretty uh, on target. So again, the first one is authenticity. Is what we're selling kind of true to who we are? I like to think of that as sort of gravity. If we're trying to sell a notion that's just not true and, and the market already kind of knows that, um, it's, it's like rolling that boulder up a hill. It's, it's just it's going to be difficult every step of the way. So um, authenticity. The second characteristic that I think is really important is um, consistency. If, for example, if I'm an employer and I'm considering you as a candidate for a position, if I look at your LinkedIn and then I request your resume and I look at your resume and I find maybe an online portfolio website that you have, plus I talk to you and then I talk to a couple of your references, am I getting a fairly consistent vision of who you are what you're all about. If not, that's kind of a red flaggy right there. So authenticity, 
consistency. The third one, and by the way, in many cases I see this, uh, especially with employer brand and, and, and product branding, is uh, relevance. Great, so you're being authentic, you're being honest, it's consistent, but is it relevant to employers, for example? Is what you're selling what they're buying? Is this what they want to know about you? Is this what they're looking for? Now, I think the three of those things kind of add up to a fourth thing, which is really what this is all about, what a personal branding is all about, and that is differentiation. You know, whatever program you're in here, computer security, for example, there's plenty of other people in that program. On paper, especially when you graduate and don't really have a lot of real world experience yet, you guys are all going to kind of have that same, again, on paper, you're pretty much the same. So why do I choose you? Why not, you know, that person instead? What makes you different? What makes you different than the other people who have approximately the same qualifications? So. That as a backdrop is kind of personal branding, what we mean by personal branding. And again, we're gonna talk about LinkedIn as one of the most important examples or manifestations of your personal brand, but it spills over to anything and everything. And we'll kind of bring in other elements, yeah. Or just wanna make sure everybody can hear you in the back. Yeah, is this even on right now? I don't think it is. Yeah, yeah I just got a thumbs up. Oh, you did? Uh, okay. I, I've been told I project. <clears throat> So, um, okay, so that's kind of a good backdrop about personal branding. A couple of other things that I wanna share as a backdrop is, um, and it kind of tees up, again, everything that I'm talking about, think of LinkedIn tonight. I mean, on one hand, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about LinkedIn. On the other hand, it is sort of more a kind of, a, just sort of, I'm just using it as an example, social media in general and personal branding in general. But a couple of reasons why I really do want to focus on LinkedIn. First of all, there's really four different ways that you as job seekers or future job seekers can look for jobs. Uh, one is to post, you know, to, to go and apply for jobs online. That's, you know, for many job seekers, been kind of the traditional way of doing things for the past 10 years. Um, a second way is to network. Networking is fantastic, uh, but it's not a very fast path to employ employment. Networking, by the way, is when you kind of start by talking to everybody you know. Your parents, your parents' friends, you go visit them at their office, have kind of a pretend interview, and then when you're leaving, ask them, who else do you know who I should talk to? It's a great way, by the way, to get used to interviewing. It's a great way to have doors open to you that might not otherwise be. It's a very slow way to find a job. Um, the third way is, is, is really, well, what recruiters call this is, is sourcing, is to be findable, is to make sure that when I, as a recruiter, am looking for somebody like you, that I find you, which kind of leads to the fourth way, which is just working with recruiters. The difference there is sourcing is typically how recruiters find you. You know, what they then do is, is kind of the fourth one. Here's the reason why tonight's topic is so important, and it sort of falls into that third bucket, which is to be, uh, be sourceable, I guess would be the word, is... This is how employers are used to finding IT people. The other methods aren't working so well for them. When they post a position, an IT position online, depending on the type of IT position, they either get deluged with applications or they don't get any. So because they are used to this is how they find people is by having to go out and look for them. This is kind of how they've re-engineered their recruiting processes. That's how they find their good candidates. That's how they're going to be looking for you. That's why it makes sense to put your eggs in that basket mostly. I'm not saying exclusively. The second is it can take a while to make yourself sourceable in the first place. And I'm going to share specific techniques with you. But once you do, it's kind of like it's, you're done. It's now from that point on kind of out there 24 seven working its magic on your behalf. You know, while you're asleep at two o'clock in the morning, your LinkedIn profile is out there kind of, you know, singing its song, doing its dance, kind of doing this work for you. So I think that's very important. A second thing to recognize and why optimizing your LinkedIn presence is really important is that like most people, recruiters are lazy. We are lazy. We often have just crazy metrics that we have to operate by, a certain number of uh, profiles we need to look at, a certain number of people we need to contact, you know, et cetera, et cetera. We're always gonna go for the low hanging fruit. If I go to your LinkedIn and I can't make heads or tails out of it, if there's not enough there for me to really figure out are you qualified or aren't you, I'm done. I'm done, I'm moving on. So you wanna make it as quick and easy for them as possible. And I'll give you a more specific example of what this really looks like. And I'm gonna use resumes as a kind of a metaphor here, even though people, recruiters don't typically deal with resumes anymore. You might think that as a recruiter, if I sit down to a stack of 100 resumes because I'm looking to hire somebody for a position, it's obvious to think that I'm gonna go through that stack and look for the right person, right? Everybody hands up if you think that sounds logical. 
And that's exactly the opposite of what I'm going to do. I'm going to go through that stack as quickly as I possibly can and get rid of as many of them as I possibly can for any reason whatsoever. Typos, please make my life easy. Um, I don't like the font, you know, Comic Sans. Oh, you're out of there. Um, so, because what I want to do is I want to make that stack far more manageable. I want to get it down to a stack of 11 resumes. Then I will go through and actually look for the one that is, is the most relevant to me as a recruiter. So, uh, again, what you want to do is make yourself sort of part of that, what I've already called kind of the low-hanging fruit here. So, um, I'm going to use LinkedIn here, and what I'm actually going to do is, again, kind of the idea here is we all understand this general concept that we want our LinkedIn to put our best foot forward. So what exactly does that look like? Uh, and I'm going to kind of break it down for you in terms of, as a recruiter, what exactly am I looking for? And um, I'd like a volunteer, and I'm actually going to go ahead and suggest, Gage, do you mind, since we're already connected, and I think your resume, your uh, LinkedIn profile is a good, it's, it's, it's decent, so there's some things to kind of compliment you on, and there's also some room for improvement, so great, thank you. Okay, um, the, what's the very first thing that just catches your eye on a LinkedIn profile? The picture, of course, the photo. So having a photo on your LinkedIn, and this should not even need to be said, but you would not believe how many profiles that the recruiters look at that don't have that photo. To have that default silhouette or the blue nubby, as we like to call it, really it, it's a kind of a shortcut for saying to the world, I'm on LinkedIn, but I have no idea what I'm doing here which is probably not the uh, kind of the message that you want to send. So having a photograph, now the conventional wisdom, by the way, um, is, is that you need to have a professional photograph. Dressed the way that I am, I'm here to tell you that that's BS. I don't buy into that whatsoever. Now, that being said, I'm not suggesting you have an unprofessional photograph. And I've seen some examples. Uh, um, one totally inadvertent, my favorite, was a, a friend of mine who, um, he had a picture of, uh, it was him with his like two young daughters kissing him, and at the full-size photo, you could see that, but at the smaller thumbnail version that's used in places on LinkedIn, all you could see is that there was two women kissing him. <laughs> so, um, so I, again, not unprofessional, you don't want unprofessional, but a professional photograph is not necessary. What I think is more important is a few things. One, LinkedIn social networking is all about connecting with people. In fact, one of my, my favorite definitions of LinkedIn, and I think we're probably past the point in LinkedIn's life cycle that we really need to be this basic about what it is, but it really is, it's the six degrees of Kevin Bacon finally turned into something practical. In fact, um, is everybody familiar with the concept behind six degrees, the six degrees of separation? Okay, I see a couple of uh, people uh, sort of shaking their heads. The idea there was uh, actually proposed by an anthropologist long before social media, long before LinkedIn, that everybody on this planet was no more on average than six degrees removed. In other words, if I sat down with somebody in Zimbabwe, if we literally listed every single person we knew and figured out who all those, those people know, that we would never be more than six degrees away from anybody on this planet. Now, interestingly enough, an anthropologist has recently proposed that because of social media, that number is now three. So social media is not just sort of mirroring reality and social uh, constructs as we know them, it's actually impacting them, but that's kind of a whole other tangent. So, um, so uh, again, photograph, very important because it's all about people connecting with people. I, so that leads to a couple of other things. One, I'm more of a fan of, of pictures where people are smiling. That's kind of the thing for me. You want to look like somebody that people want to connect to. Um, so that's kind of a, a thing for me. And finally, pictures where people are actually recognizable. Um, I've been told, and I know that I'm kind of guilty of this, uh, that uh, you know that photo of me is like 10 years old. I walk into, you know, coffee shops to meet people and they don't recognize me necessarily. So um, another good example of pictures that are not necessarily all that great is illustrations instead of photos. Yeah, that's all very cute, especially if you're an illustrator, but it doesn't help me recognize you in a coffee shop or for an interview. Um, or pictures like where there's a group of people. I don't know which one you are. Um, so or a question I had recently, somebody actually reached out to me and asked me, is it appropriate for me to have my gun in my LinkedIn photo? <laughs> and my response was simply, if you're a gunsmith or a law enforcement officer, perhaps it is. Other than that, probably not. 
So that's kind of the first thing that my eye is kind of drawn to. The second thing that is really quite relevant is, um, so your name uh, should be your name. Um, one of the things, and by the way, LinkedIn used to have really bad search functionality, so it used to be that if you actually thought you were supposed to put your last name, comma, first name, if people searched first name, last name, they wouldn't even find you. They've fixed that, but you still want to have just first name, last name. Um, that next line, student at Milwaukee Area Technical uh, College, for most people what happens is what it is, it's their title at their employer. And the reason why that is, is because that's what uh, LinkedIn automatically does for you. Because it wants to be really sure you have this line populated so it automatically does that. So I highly recommend to people to change it just to show I understand that I can change it. Also, in many cases, your title, especially if it's a vague title at a company that people haven't heard of before, is not necessarily the best representation of your personal brand. Because that's what that second line, your headline really is. That's the short version of your personal brand. So there's a couple of things you want to consider as you uh, kind of put together what should it possibly be instead. I mean, there's nothing wrong with what that is right now. But here's a good things to kind of think about. One, sort of what is the most impactful way that I can describe my personal brand? It's, it's a cute example, so I'll share it. I don't think it's necessarily a great example and it completely fails the next test that I'll share with you. But um, uh, a friend of mine in San Francisco is a marketing director. As a marketing director in San Francisco, she better have a cute headline. So it's a creative and professional creative professional. But that fails the following rule, which is, um, and I'm gonna come back to the concept of SEO several times tonight, so I really need to know for sure. Does anybody not know what SEO is? Not know what's, okay, search engine optimization. Here's a simple explanation. If I owned a company that made widgets, I would wanna be really sure that anytime anybody went to uh, Google and entered widgets, that not only did I come up somewhere in that list of results, I came up near the top. Ultimately, that's what you're engaged in on LinkedIn. Almost everything we're talking about here, that whole being findable, being sourceable, you want to make sure that when people like me, recruiters, are looking for people like you, we find you. So it's all about SEO. So the words that are in your headline get lots of extra brownie points, lots of extra mojo when it comes to SEO. So you want to make sure to use the words that somebody would use to try to find somebody like you. So um, in cases, you know, one of the things that I often see older job uh, seekers, a problem or mistake that they make is, you know, experienced project manager. Not only is experienced an invitation for ageism, but no recruiter is ever going to look for you using the word experienced. It just doesn't happen. So do you really want to waste any of your headline with that? Another popular word for people in transition looking for jobs is, is transition or looking for my next great opportunity. Those are not words that a recruiter is going to look for somebody to find somebody with your skill set. So you really got to kind of weigh the how much does that belong in my headline. But again, the key idea is it's your short version of your personal brand and that you can change it, which just to prove that you understand LinkedIn, maybe that means you should change it. So, okay, um, kind of going to skip over here to this, this right here. Especially for people who... You know, for some types of jobs, LinkedIn expertise is really kind of considered a qualification for the job. If I'm looking to hire a marketing manager, that's kind of important. So I'm, I'm looking for, I'm actually looking for an arbitrary but an important number. Anybody know what that is? I'll give you a hint. It's when the plus sign appears. 500. Because up to 500, it lists the actual number of people you're connected to. Over 500, it just says 500 plus, whether it's 501 or 5,000. So you just want to kind of get up to that magical 500 number. Here's why this is really important. It's not just because that becomes sort of an indication that you know what you're doing on LinkedIn and you're fairly proficient at it. But secondly, and this is a little bit of an oversimplification, but it's an important one, and arguably the most important idea I'll share with you this evening, the size of your network really matters. Grow your network, one is just to get in the habit of anytime somebody hands you a business card, networking event, or you're just kind of networking and meeting people, um, just get in the habit of reflexively saying, hey, I'll, I'll send you an invitation to connect on LinkedIn. Um, and then follow up within 24 hours while it's still kind of top of mind. So that's suggestion number one, actually three suggestions. Suggestion number two, and by the way, the more connections you have, the more visible you become on LinkedIn, so the more this is gonna happen. One of the most common questions that I get from people about LinkedIn, especially more seasoned users who have been out there for a while and have lots of connections is, I keep getting invitations from people I don't even know. Should I accept those? Why would I accept those? Should I accept those? 
Here's my answer to that, and it's predicated on a piece of knowledge that very few people know about LinkedIn, which is, as a LinkedIn user, you only get a finite number of invitations to use during your, your, your life cycle on LinkedIn. And I don't mean per month or per year, I mean life, lifetime. I have heard that there's a secret number, I've heard it's 2,000, so it's a big number, but the fact of the matter is, it's a finite number. So, anytime I receive an invitation from a stranger to connect on LinkedIn, my re response is, thank you. I don't even know you, and you're offering to grow my LinkedIn network for me, using up one of your invitations so I don't have to. Now, the price that I pay for this promiscuous linking is that once a month or so, somebody tries to sell me a timeshare. I typically ignore it the first time, the second time I just disconnect from them. So it's not, my point being, it's not like this opens me up to a world of, of spam or anything like that. So um, that's the second way to kind of grow your, your network is just to routinely accept those invitations. Why not? The third is to use search, and by the way, always use advanced search. The problem with, so I can actually say, okay, I'm looking specifically for, in this case, it's a keyword and it's a lion, all caps. LION stands for LinkedIn Open Networker. It's a self-designation. It's not like there's a certification involved. What it really is, it's a way of telling the world, I understand that it's important for me as a LinkedIn user to have a really big network. So if you invite me, I won't say no. That's really all it means. If you invite me, I won't say no. There's three reasons why LinkedIn uh, Open Networkers, why LIONS can really help you grow your extended network um, faster. And by the way, I should explain real quick Extended network. So if anybody actually your age actually still uses Facebook, I'm going to compare LinkedIn and Facebook. So Facebook, well, the fundamental, one of the fundamental differences there on Facebook, either we're connected or we're not connected. It's that simple and people like it that way. On LinkedIn, it's more complicated. If we connect, you go two degrees further into my network and I go two degrees further into your network. That, by the way, is the power of LinkedIn, but it's also kind of something to keep in mind. But my goal and this is kind of a mind shift here. My goal is to grow my extended network as much as possible. I almost don't care about my direct network. So it's one of the reasons why I urge people, people who get really hung up on when they get an invitation from somebody, they ask themselves, why would I want to connect with that person? I say, you know, move past that to two, two different ways of looking at this. One, instead, ask yourself, is there any reason I wouldn't want to accept this? And two, to recognize it's not about you. It's about all those many other people you bring to the party with you. That's what I care about. So that being said, there are three reasons why lions are really useful to you if you need to grow your LinkedIn extended network quickly. Um, one, well, first of all, many of them are, are recruiters, so they have networks that are optimized for recruiting. Second of all, um, I mean, unlike most strangers, you know, if you actually, if you, even though I suggested you accept invitations from strangers on LinkedIn, I do not suggest that you send invitations to strangers because most of them will ignore it or blackball you, report you, and if you get reported enough times, you get kicked off LinkedIn permanently. So, um, so the second reason connecting with Lions it can be a fast, easy way to grow your network is that's what Lion means is I'm not gonna report you. I'll say yes if you invite me. The third, and I kind of buried the lead here, because they are, again, to use the term promiscuous linkers, they tend to already have really big LinkedIn networks. So connecting with a single lion, can, because of the people they bring to the party, can grow your extended network more than connecting with 100 average LinkedIn users. So three fast ways to grow your network. Back to where we were. Okay, good. So we're kind of done with the important stuff. At the, oh, there's one other thing that I'll share with you here. Um, this is what's called uh, Gage's uh, public URL, which is what he can kind of use in his uh, email messages, for example, as part of his SIG line, just an easy way to link to his, his LinkedIn profile. If you can see what it looks like right there, it's like www.linkedin.com slash something, Gage Bartlett, blah, 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 blah. A bunch of just gobbledygook appended to the end. It doesn't have to be that way. If you go into edit, you can kind of claim, claim your personal URL which it may, basically what you're trying to do is just kind of carve off all the gobbledygook at the end. If you have a fairly unusual name, so this might actually work for you, you can usually claim, claim your name, work for me too. Um, if you're, you know, John Smith or Kim Kardashian, good luck with that. Uh, but you'll at least be able to carve off some of the gobbledygook. And again, this is an example of, um, there's an old quote, supposedly Cary Grant once said that a good first impression is made of a thousand details. 
A lot of what I'm sharing with you today, tiny, tiny details, but the sum total of these. So this is another example of the fact that you did this shows that you understand LinkedIn well enough to show that you understood how to do it and that there's some value in doing it. Okay. So that's all the kind of stuff up at the top, which is important if you know the expression above the fold. This is the stuff that if I'm being lazy, and again, recruiters, lazy, you know, we don't necessarily have or make the time to scroll down. So this is the stuff that I get right away. Now, the second thing, and it's missing here, and this is another one of those kind of key takeaways for today, is summary session section. You don't have a summary section simply because you didn't put any content there, so LinkedIn automatically hides it. Um, some summary sections are really important, especially for certain types of job seekers. And I think one of the most important is people who are farther along in their career. Um, if you were to see my career history, I'll tell you right now, I don't want a recruiter trying to make sense of my career, career history. I really don't, because they're just going to come to the conclusion that I'm schizophrenic. I mean, sales and, and marketing, recruiting. Um, I was the webmaster at Kohl's department stores in 1999. I mean, I've done a little bit of everything. I do not want a recruiter to try to make sense of that and figure out what I want to be when I grow up. I want to be the person that kind of ties it all together neatly, puts a silver bow on it and kind of puts it out there. So that summary section is, remember I said that the headline is your short version of your personal brand? Your summary section is the deluxe version of your personal brand. And it's probably important uh, second only to that photograph. Because <clears throat> again, this is really where you, um, you really describe what you bring to the table. Now, a couple of thoughts about that. Some common mistakes that I see often, um, aside from just not having one, is people who are summarizing, well, one, they summarize what the company they work for, works for what that company does. Okay, that's, that's great, but that's not your personal brand. So you might think you're doing this for the team. No, all you're really doing is using your LinkedIn to tell the world, again, I'm on LinkedIn, but I don't know what I'm doing. So that's a mistake. Or to summarize what I'm currently doing. Again, especially once you're a little bit farther along in your career, you want to tie it all together neatly and, and kind of explain, here's everything I bring to the table. So, you know, one of the things that I sometimes get asked is, so what goes in the summary? Is it just, you know, work experience? Is it education? Is it personal stuff? The simple answer is, yeah. Anything that answers the question behind the question. And as a job seeker, what's the question behind the question? Your summary, the, the surface level question is, who am I? What's the question behind that? Why should I hire you? I mean, and, and there's, 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 I'm gonna, this is where I'm going to kind of go bigger picture for a minute. There's some important corollaries here, some important parallels. Um, a few other things that are really, really, really relevant and, and should look a lot and sound a lot like your summary, not identical because that just looks redundant. But um, two examples, one, your elevator speech, that 20 second kind of rehearsed when somebody asks you, oh, I heard you're graduating, what do you want to do? You know, you don't want to go free form at that point. You want to have a pretty cohesive, well thought out answer. So your elevator speech, your summary section on your LinkedIn, and a third thing that I'll share here in a moment, really should be very parallel. They're perhaps the most important elements of that answering that what is my personal brand kind of a thing. So think back to the criteria, authenticity, consistency, relevance, differentiation. Um, and that, that third thing, so again, is, is the summary. And it, you know, your summary, I like to say it, it should be your story. And so here's another thing, that I, another mistake that I commonly make. If I were to tell you a story that started out, George is a seasoned recruiting professional with 15, it's like, great story. You're off to a wonderful start. I can't wait to hear the rest of that story. So tell a story. Stories, it's like a bad episode of Seinfeld. Somebody who talks about themselves in the third person. Forget about that resume, horrible third person, no personal pronouns allowed. Tell your story. Here's a great example. It was a profile I, I saw at least five years ago at this point, the fact that I can quote the first sentence back to you five years later shows that it was a pretty powerful beginning to a summary. First sentence, I got my first job when I was 12 years old. I was hooked. There was no way I was not gonna read the rest of that summary. So, and that also illustrates again the idea that what goes in your summary? Anything that answers the question, why should I hire you? If it's personal, if it's professional, if it's educational, whatever it is. So that summary is really, really important. Again, it answers the question behind the question. What makes you different? Why should I hire you? And it really kind of tells your story. And it sort of wraps up everything that follows in a nice, neat package. 
So we really have covered the most important stuff, but I do want to kind of zip through the rest of this fairly quickly. And there's one other uh, very important point that I want to make, and this is really the SEO portion of our uh, of our discussion here. So um, you've got your uh, your career history listed, which is great. You're missing detail. And you want to have the detail here because that's where the SEO comes in. So a couple of tips about that. One, some people, one of the mistakes that they made is they may maybe put out, like, fill out the, um, for a current internship, for example, or job, they fill out the detail, but they don't do it for their older ones. You never know which keyword that you list under which of your job experiences is going to be the magic bullet that gets you found by the recruiter that has the perfect opportunity for you. So trying to get inside the head of a recruiter who's looking for somebody like you Sounds like a, the, the recipe for a really bad, boring psychological thriller movie. You don't want to go down that path. So the simple solution is to be as complete and descriptive as possible. Don't try to get inside the head of a recruiter who's looking for you. Just, this is what I did. Now, second point here, I'm going to get a little more technical on you because, well, that's specifically what I'm going to do here, and you'll understand why, is when I suggested that you write your um, summary using very plain language, tell a story, I'm going to give you the exact opposite advice for the detail that you provide under each of your job experiences. And this is where the SEO comes in. One of the things that recruiters learn the first time that we, um, as soon as we start sourcing, because we have to have, use a fancy word, we can't say searching. Once we start sourcing on LinkedIn, one of the things we quickly under, come to understand is that the uh, obvious search terms are useless. Here's what I mean by that. If I am looking for human resources people, what are two of the most useless words I could possibly use to search for them? Human resources. Human and resources. Because here's what I'm doing. If I go to that basic search bar at the top and I, and I enter human resources, and you all know Google, what am I telling LinkedIn? Bring back every profile on LinkedIn who has either the word human or the word resources anywhere in their profile. Again, useless. Now, I like that example because it lends itself to some much better solutions, but I also like IT because this is another common mistake. If I am looking for IT professionals, IT, it is certainly one of the most useless words I could possibly use for a search, but let's go beyond that. Information, technology, software, hardware, computer. So, as I tell civilians, non-IT people, about searching for IT people, I say, you ever seen two IT people start talking? And like a few seconds later, you know they're still speaking English, but you know what they're saying is just kind of completely over your head. I say, those are the words. Those words they're using right there, those are the words that you want to use to find those people. Human resources, kind of a comparable example. And these uh, acronyms might not make a lot of sense to you. You might not have heard of them because you're not HR people, but FMLA, OFCCP, FSLA, these are words that HR people live and breathe. They're, they're like laser beams that help me find just the right people and all the right people on LinkedIn. Normal people do not have words like OFCCP and, and HIPAA on their, on their profiles. So from an SEO standpoint, again, to make sure that when somebody likes, like me, a recruiter is looking for somebody like you, you get found. Again, as complete and descriptive as possible, and whereas under the summary, I'm urging you to use very plain language that tells your story and anyone can understand, under the detail under your jobs, I'm urging you to do exactly the opposite. Go ahead and get, get gritty, get technical. Use the names of the systems, the hardware, the, the names of the, the software programs you are using, the programming languages, any acronyms, any of that stuff, CompTIA, the stuff that's gonna be unique to people that are you know, in, in positions like yours and having followed tracks like yours is the stuff that's going to essentially make sure you get found. So that's kind of a key thing about background. I think just, um, you know, everything else is of some value. Having, you know, your education, certainly very good. Volunteer experience is very good. Organizations, that's fantastic. Certifications, extremely good, especially things like CompTIA, security, um, stuff like that. You absolutely want to list all that stuff. Uh, but I'm going to skip to a section that I often get asked about, and it looks like maybe because you just, just don't like it, like most of the people I talk to have avoided this altogether. So I'm going to hop over to my profile, just so I can actually look at this. And it's another one of like really common questions that I get is, um, the what the heck is up with this stuff? Or the way the question often gets asked, and anybody who's a little more active and has more connections here on LinkedIn is probably familiar with this, is 
why do I keep getting recommended for basket weaving by people that I don't even know? There's a couple, a couple of questions rolled into, into one there, and I'm going to answer the second one first. By people I don't even know? Well, it's because you took George's advice and connected with people you don't even know on LinkedIn, which leads to the first problem, which is those people you don't even know, they don't know what to recommend you for. So when LinkedIn pops up, and I think you've probably all seen this, seen this feature, LinkedIn and pops up and says, hey, Gage, you want to recommend George for basket weaving? And you're like, uh, okay, sure, yeah, click. So you end up typically getting a lot of um, skills and endorsements that are not necessarily part of what I, I like to urge you to think of as your core brand. I'm breaking the advice that I'm about to give you here, by the way, as I'll acknowledge in a second. You really want to trim this down to kind of core strengths, that core part of your responsibilities, core part of your, you know, what, is, what do you bring to the table again? I remember an example, I was actually talking to a CEO on the phone, kind of going through his list and helping him do a LinkedIn tune-up. And we're going through the list here, and, we, and PowerPoint was listed. And I was like, ah, you'll want to get rid of that. And he said, whoa. He said, I'm really good at PowerPoint. <laughs> I said, I, I bet you are. I believe that. But really, as a CEO, is that really kind of part of the core strengths, you know, skill set that you bring to the table? So again, I'm clearly violating this advice grossly here. It's, it's mainly, well, if you saw my yard, you'd understand. I, I similarly haven't really trimmed you know, anything in the yard for a long time either. I just haven't gotten kind of around to cleaning up here. Because that's what I suggest you do, is don't, don't fret over why people that you barely know are recommending you for things you don't know. Don't worry about it at all. Just go in there and, and kind of house clean. It's very easy when you go into edit mode to kind of just clip them. Um, if you click the little um, pencil icons, for example. So you really want to, ideally, I mean, if you can get there, I'm a long way from this, but if you can keep it to just that top list. Now, these are skills, by the way. Here's an interesting vision. People have asked me, what the heck is up with that whole endorsement thing? Because long before there were endorsements, there were just skills. You would just list these skills, and then LinkedIn came in along with these endorsements. So just because it's, it's interesting more than anything else, I want to share with you a vision of what is in, up with endorsements and why it's either an awesome thing that's going to become incredibly powerful, or it's hor a horrible thing that they should just get rid of right away. The idea here, and this is kind of where I see LinkedIn taking this, is that um, your credibility, for example, with recruiting, your credibility will ultimately not just be based on how many people have endorsed you for that, but how many people have endorsed the people who endorsed you, and how many people have endorsed the people who endorsed the people who endorsed you, et cetera, et cetera. So it becomes a very interesting waiting system. If you've ever seen the show Black Mirror, the first episode of season three sort of carried this idea to a ridiculous extreme. But in some ways, that sounds like it has a lot of credibility because the quality of your endorsements really matters. In other ways, it becomes high school all over again. The, the popular kids just want to hang out with the popular kids. They all become more popular. The unpopular kids become less popular, et cetera, et cetera. So, now that being said, uh, I don't see any progress being made in either towards this like this great, wonderful, this could be a wonderful thing. It's been kind of a stagnant feature for a while, so it's not necessarily all that important, but I think it's interesting. So, at least just scroll through real quick. Oh, um, another uh, common question I get is, um, uh, recommendations, which is different than endorsements. That's where actually people recommend you for stuff. You know, it's kind of important um, with a couple of caveats. One, employers always take that stuff with a grain of salt, um, even more so than they do like, you know, I don't know why they make, like would treat a reference check phone call as being like more credible than what's said, what's said on LinkedIn, but they do. Secondly, and this is a good way to sort of undermine the credibility of the recommendations you get on LinkedIn, is the whole, you scratch my back, I scratch yours. If, you know, you recommend me for recruiting one day and I recommend you for social media the next day, employers can see that. And that just kind of, you know, quid pro quo makes the, kind of undermines the whole credibility thing. So one of the games that I kind of play with people is when they, when they recommend me for something, I immediately, in case they don't know this, I send them a very nice message saying, thank you so much, I really appreciate the recommendation. As I'm sure you are aware, it would just make us both look bad if I turn around to recommend you for something. So I'll just leave it at thank you for the recommendation. Now, um, by the way, Another thought about recommendations is there's actually a feature on LinkedIn that's tied to recommendations, which lets you actually reach out to people and ask for a recommendation. To me, that's just tacky, especially people who I haven't talked to for a while. You know, it's like I haven't bothered to pick up the phone and call you for the past little year and a half, and then I reach out to you on LinkedIn and say, can you recommend me for these six things? So I prefer to make it a personal phone call or a personal email. 
Um, just something, again, a little more personal. And what I do find, because sometimes I, I can't put words in your mouth, but sometimes I do want to kind of steer the sort of recommendation. Maybe I'm looking at a somewhat different type of new position and I really need to get some recommendations that are kind of apropos. Again, I find I can't really reach out uh, to somebody, you know, and, and say, hey, Mark, I need a recommendation for, for, you know, can you please tell the world that I'm the greatest project manager ever? But I can say, you know, we worked together on that project at NML and you complimented me once on, you know, kind of keeping everything on track. If you can speak to that, I would really appreciate it. The odds are really, really good. You're going to get exactly the recommendation that, uh, again, if, if he's really willing to make a recommendation, that you're going to get the recommendation that you're, you're kind of looking for. So, um, Again, there's lots of other stuff here. You know, you can go into um, projects that you've been working on. That can be really good, especially if you're, you know, like social media people, for example, often have lots of specific projects. IT, I suppose, would lend itself to that as well, you know, software development projects and stuff like that. But I do want to leave a couple of minutes for questions here, and we are well, four, four minutes for questions. So um, I think I've kind of covered, just to kind of wrap up again, you know, we started by talking about what are the characteristics of good personal branding. As I shared with you, I wanted to focus on LinkedIn because this is really the tool that recruiters are using these days. On the one hand, LinkedIn, you know, most of us, most especially recruiters who otherwise love LinkedIn, will freely acknowledge it's jumped the shark. It really has. There's an increasing number of reasons to really dislike LinkedIn. Um, the bottom line, though, is there's really no other game in town. It's not like there's something else out there that's like LinkedIn that looks well poised to take over. There's an interesting Spanish um, personal networking site that kind of tries to blend Facebook and LinkedIn called BB that's fun. Um, it doesn't have anywhere near the critical mass to be a replacement for LinkedIn yet, but it makes it kind of interesting. Um, and again, just sort of talked about understanding that LinkedIn needs to put your best foot forward. What specifically does that look, look like? How are recruiters trying to find you on LinkedIn? What is it they're looking for when they get to your profile? So this is kind of a, a summary. Questions? How important are organizations and uh, sort of extracurriculars like that? <clears throat> Excellent question. I think they're um, I think they're very important, but you got to be kind of careful. There's that whole crossing, you know, if we're involved in, in religious organizations, political organizations. I talked to a guy once who really stressed that he was the head of his Scottish clan organization on, on LinkedIn. And I, I mean, I'm Scottish. I'm part of a clan. I don't know that I would really promote that fact on my, on my LinkedIn. But he pointed out that he had actually been running this organization for like the past 10 years. And really, he felt that it was an important leadership. Uh, position. So, I mean, he kind of convinced me that, you know, maybe. But again, you just got to be kind of careful about that. So I, I think they're very important. Uh, a lot of employers really like to see people who volunteer. For some employers, that's something that's actually critically important. But again, you know, as soon as you cross lines that are not causes they support or go against their political or religious beliefs, it can really backfire in a big way. So. What's your opinion on sharing articles or on you know, that's apps. Thank you for asking that because I've, I've missed an entire dimension on LinkedIn, and not surprisingly, because I would typically do this presentation for four or five hours. But um, it's what we really talked about. Everything we talked about today is being findable. There are many other ways for using LinkedIn, one of which is kind of personal branding through status updates and posting articles and commenting on articles. I think it's absolutely invaluable, especially if you're in any sort of position where you want to establish thought leadership and or you want to establish that you really know how LinkedIn works, um, that sort of thing, or you're in PR and you want to, you know, I, I, I create meaningful content on a regular basis. So I think it's incredibly valuable. Um, there's a certain line you have to cross there, and, and it's not unlikely any of you are, are going to bang into this line anytime soon, but that's spending enough time, you know, do, doing that so often that people start to wonder, my God, does that person have a job? Do they do anything other than, you know, work on LinkedIn? I mean, which, let's face it, it's not exactly, LinkedIn is not exactly the most fun place to spend hours a day. So, but uh, that, above and beyond that, again, as long as you're avoiding controversial con content, which, I mean, the, the one of the big divides and one just ongoing source of controversy here is people who don't understand the difference between what goes on Facebook and what goes on LinkedIn. <sighs> Which a related thought there is, you know, a great article I read recently is that people really need to understand that when you like something on LinkedIn, you're sharing that something. So when you choose to like an inappropriate photo that somebody else has posted, guess what? You're posting that same inappropriate photo essentially to your network. So, but for the most part, again, that's a very important form of personal branding. I also, um, do I have another two minutes to go off on one, one last tangent? So, 
One other really important technique that's unrelated to uh, being sourceable and that personal branding piece is, and this might be the most important of all, is using LinkedIn as a basis. So sometimes one of the pushbacks I get on LinkedIn is it's a poor substitute for real world network networking. It's not a substitute for real world networking. It's a tremendous enhancement to real world networking. So here's the ultimate example, and I love LinkedIn for this reason, um, is if I find out about an opportunity at the ABC company, let's say I use a job board. Job boards, as you might have quickly discovered, are great one-stop shopping for who's hiring for what. They are a terrible way to apply for positions. You might just as well wad up your resume and throw it out the window. So that being said though, great way to learn about jobs then try to figure out who do I know who works for that company or knows somebody who works for that company. Here's how I do this, and by the way, this is the ultimate example of why having a big LinkedIn network um, is important. If I have a big LinkedIn network, this works really well. If I don't, it doesn't work at all. Is to go under advanced search, and let's say that I just learned about a great opportunity at the Acme company. To go to Acme, because again, if I use basic search, it doesn't know if that's somebody's name or what exactly that is. And I can even then say current or past. In this case, I'll leave that wide open. Click search. Now, notice that because I've got a big enough network, not only do I have some decent connections here, I have not just first level connections, which means people I probably know, but actually more than one. So I can even pick and choose and say, okay, which of these people do I know the best? Who do I consider most reliable and therefore maybe uh, an employer would? Who's willing to make that introduction to, for me so I can figure out kind of that foot in the side door? If for no other reason to get some intel. One of the questions that one of the job seekers asked me before here is, um, how should I dress for interviews? Well, you know, it used to be a pretty safe answer, a suit and tie, it's not anymore. It varies from organization to organization. There are organizations that they dress business casual, they assume that you've got the wherewithal to do enough research to figure that out on your own, and to, to show up overdressed would be considered inappropriate and kind of a sign of poor judgment. Um, so to, to just gather intel like that, to reach out to a friend of a friend and say, hey listen, you know, do you just have five minutes, I just have some questions about the company, about do you know who's the hiring manager, what can you tell me about him or her? Um, et cetera, et cetera. One of the things that that'll give you, by the way, that's really critical, that's a huge differentiation between the people who just applied on, on a job board, for example, versus you having the wherewithal to do this kind of through the side door thing. Those people, once they apply online, they're done. They don't have the option of following up because they don't even know who to follow up with. So, I mean, imagine getting a friend of a friend on the phone and saying, yo, oh, you sound like you're really busy. Can I just ask you one quick question? Who's the hiring manager for that, um, that social media job? Can I get the correct spelling of her name? And what's her title? Oh my God, I mean, it's, it's such a tiny little morsel of information and it's a huge competitive advantage I now have over those poor slobs who did nothing more than applying on a job board. I know who to follow up with. I know how to spell their name. I know what their title is. So that's kind of one final use of LinkedIn that can be uh, really helpful is to use it to sort of augment your, your real world networking. Any other questions before you uh, wrap this up? Okay, thank you all for being here. Um, thank you very much. Uh, feel free to uh, connect with me on LinkedIn so that you use up one of your invitations so that I don't have to. Um, but seriously, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn and feel free to follow up with any questions that you might happen to have for me. I'd be happy to, to kind of answer those. Let's take five minutes and then we'll go on to the last part.